All right, good morning, City Church. It is great to see everybody here today. Uh, we're glad that you are with us on Father's Day. I, I just want to say that the TV down here is not showing anything except for the time. Uh, I don't know if something has to sh uh, switch there. Okay, hey, it is Father's Day, and I just want to say something real quick uh, about uh, Father's Day at City Church. So uh, we believe that as uh, men that we are called to lead by serving. And so, uh, you know, when our men get together and we do our, our, our men's events, uh, one of the things that we say is that we never want to take more than we give as men. We want to be invested in the world around us. And so for Father's Day, the, one of the reasons why we do the bacon bar, which I know the, the fathers are really hyped about, but we do it this way because we want to make sure that we are, uh, are, are participating with all of the people that we do life with. And so this is an opportunity for fellowship and celebrating fathers. It's also an opportunity for us to all be together and to love on each and every one of you. So can we just take a moment and tell our fathers in the house how much we love them and we appreciate them? Listen, if you are not a father yet um, and you have it in your heart that you want to be a dad, uh, I just, uh, my, my prayer is that uh, you will uh, make that decision sooner than later. We live in a culture that is pretty anti-child uh, and there's all the excuses, all the reasons why you shouldn't start a family. You're not gonna find any of that supported in scripture. You will not find anything inside of the Bible that says, hey, it's better to just chill and wait. Uh, instead, what you're gonna find is that children are a blessing from God. They are the inheritance of fathers. And so uh, I just, I have this picture that one day there's going to be like, you know, 25 or 50 little Simpsons all together for Christmas. And that's, you know, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they're all going to be there. And Carmen and I are going to be looking at that. And I just can't imagine that we're sitting there going, there's too many of us, right? I have a feeling that we're going to be like, this is pretty awesome. Look at what we were able to play a role in. Look at the investment that we made and how our family has grown. And so I, I hope that uh, my kids will have kids once they're married and uh, that their children will have children and that we will uh, be able to, to, to see that inheritance that God promises uh, for those who start families. So I just want to encourage you to just, just the culture's so broken, you know? Uh, don't look at kids as a problem or a nuisance or a hindrance, right? Uh, you, you're never gonna be able to afford them. God's gonna make the way, right? If you're just like, oh, I gotta get enough money in the bank, like, that's just silly. You're just, inflation's gonna kill your money in the bank anyway. So just, you know, uh, just trust God and let him make a way. So anyway, that's my, my two cents. Happy Father's Day. Uh, we are in our uh, third and final week of our series. We're taking a look at three risks that come with wealth. Uh, and so there, uh, Jesus has been teaching and he has been helping to illustrate for us that uh, being wealthy, right, does not always make life easier. In fact, that as we gain wealth, there are some new risks that enter into our lives. So if we could right now stand for the reading of the word, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 16, beginning here in verse 19. Uh, it says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted. 
comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convict, convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that it bears witness to in our lives for our benefit. I pray that as we look at it today, that we'll be encouraged, that we'll be challenged, Lord, that we'll be strengthened. Have your way in this place. And we ask this in your mighty name, amen. You guys can be seated. Uh, so the third risk of wealth is indifference, indifference. So week one, we talked about the risk of being gullible. Uh, if you'll remember here at the beginning of chapter 16, Jesus is ministering to the disciples. And, uh, and as he's ministering, Ministering, the Pharisees have gathered around. They are listening, and uh, they begin to chuckle. They begin to laugh. They begin to scoff, is what the scriptures say. And Jesus, in week two, we looked at this, turns to the Pharisees because he says that they were lovers of money, right? And that they have uh, manipulated the scriptures for their own benefit. And he he talks about uh, the fact that as we gain wealth, we run the risk of being vulnerable. Right, that we are vulnerable to lies, to deception. And so now Jesus turns his attention back to the disciples, okay? And he knows that the Pharisees are listening. Now, I wanna add this to this idea of the Pharisees' response, right? So, so they, are, they are listening to what Jesus has to say and they are not in agreement. Why? They're not in agreement because they have a biblical argument they're not in agreement because they, it does not align with what they want in their own lives. And so it had happened uh, hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene, but uh, the Jews were just not happy with the restrictions around divorce, right? And so there were uh, really, it was very plain, uh, according to scripture, a, a reason for diver divorce. Uh, of course, God says that he would prefer that you not get divorced, that you reconcile, that you work it out. So that's the primary desire that God has, but secondarily, unfaithfulness, if you must divorce, this is is a biblical standard and this wasn't good enough. And so they began to add to the scripture. Well, surely God doesn't mean that that's the only reason. In fact, it got down uh, to, the, to the fact that if you go to the Talmud and look at some of these extra biblical teachings of the Jews, that uh, they actually believe that if your spouse breaks your favorite dish, that is cause for divorce, right? I mean, they, they had gone way off the deep end and, uh, and Jesus looks at them, they love money, they want wealth, they want to continue to make more and more money, to be wealthier and wealthier. And so they're willing to divorce, they're willing to remarry, they're willing to cheat, lie, steal, and they call themselves believers. And that's the, that's the important part. These Pharisees were not like a bunch of people who were like, yeah, I'm an atheist and I don't believe in any of this. No, these were people who were showing up at what we would call church. They were at the synagogue. They were gathering around the other believers and they were very uh, pious in their beliefs. Like, hey, you should try to be like me. Like, I'm a, I'm a very good religious person. And they had all this extra biblical teaching. And, and so this is a problem, right? There's a problem in place when we begin to add and subtract from scripture. So this is one of the reasons why we call ourselves a Bible-believing community. It's one of the reasons why we do the things we do. So we don't do prayer uh, uh, each week and give you an opportunity to respond because we're trying to be like another church, right? We're not trying to identify with some uh, uh, stream of, of teaching out there. No, the scripture says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, 
go and lay hands, just like I have laid hands on the sick. And so we want to be obedient unto the word. We don't want to add to the word. We don't want to subtract from the word. And when we get it wrong, we want to be able to go, hey, we got it wrong, so let's get it right. That's our goal here at City Church. We believe it's one of the values that uh, I, I don't want to say makes us special because I don't know the inward workings of every church in the area, but it is one of the values that I believe makes us obedient under God. It makes us worthy of being a church because we want to do what the scripture says. We trust that, that, that God knows best. And so God knowing that, I mean, Jesus knowing that the Pharisees are listening, he goes into one more teaching on wealth right here. And he begins here in, in verse 19. And he says, uh, let me tell you a story. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. So just in case you're wondering, right? Right? The Pharisees, they dressed nice. Why? Because they had resources, because they were always coming up with reasons why uh, you should give more money to their cause, right? And what you don't see is the fruit of them investing that back into the communities. Instead, you see them dressed well, living uh, uh, very lavish lifestyles. And so Jesus says there was a wealthy man. That's what we'll call him, a wealthy man. And he lived very lavishly. So this implies that he enjoyed lavish banquets and indulged in the finest foods daily as a means to showcase his wealth and indulgence. Why wear the top brand, right? Do you buy the top brand because of the quality or because it has its little symbol on it and everybody knows that you've bought the brand that has the symbol on it, right? Uh, I think that you can spend money on nice things because they're made nice, but I would argue that most of my experience with people is that they make purchases because of that branding, because of the fact that you can see what it is that uh, they own, and therefore, in, in our minds, it, 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 it adds to our, our status, right? And I think this is uh, no more truer than if we just turn to social media today and influencers who spend all their time trying to convince you how wealthy they are, how amazing their lives are, so that you'll tune in, so that they'll get more views, so that they get ad revenue, so that they get more money because they want to have nicer and nicer things to continue to flaunt in your face. And so this, this idea of living wealthy in a way that we express to the world, look how wealthy I am, that's not a new thing, right? And the church is not exempt from it. Unfortunately, uh, there are uh, uh, churches that their entire focus is around the wealth that individuals have. And so they begin to dive into extra biblical teaching where they make arguments like I was at a church one time when I was a teenager and they asked everyone in the, in, in the sanctuary to uh, raise your hand if you had a Rolex on your arm, right? And of course, I didn't have a Rolex on my arm. I'm not downing Rolexes. I think they're probably very nice watches, but the sentiment here is wrong. And that was, that the pastor said, if you're not wearing a Rolex today, it's because you're out of the will of God and you need to have more faith so that you too can have a Rolex on your arm. Like that's just not inside of scripture, right? So if you like the smooth movements of a Rolex watch and you wanna own a Rolex watch because you love the craftsmanship, no harm, no foul, right? That's your thing. But if you wanna own a Rolex because you want to rub it in everybody's face, there might be some concern here. And so there's this wealthy man who's dressing the way he's dressing. He's eating eating the way that he's eating, not because uh, he necessarily enjoys these things, but because he wants to make sure that everybody sees the way that he is living. It says here in verse 20, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores. Okay, so his wealth, the rich man became a barrier between him and God, as well as between him and his neighbor. So there's a poor man that's not across town, right? He didn't have to go to the Dominican Republic on a mission trip to find poverty, okay? He was literally able to just walk out the doors of his house and find somebody who was in need, okay? Uh, unfortunately, the rich man used his wealth as a means of expression to the world around him rather than as a benefit for the world around him. What Jesus is saying in this, in this parable, what he's saying throughout this entire teaching 
teaching is not that wealth is bad, it's the way that we manage wealth, it's the way that we use wealth. And so if we use it uh, to chase clout and make people think much of us, then we're missing the point. Instead, we've been entrusted with resources for the benefit of being able to help those around us do what? Connect with Jesus, right? For them to know that there is a God that loves them, cares for them, and is for them. So in verse 21, that this, this poor man desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So what is this poor man wanting, right? The poor man is just wanting the scraps. It's not as if he is coming and knocking on the door saying, hey, can I borrow your Porsche for the weekend, right? He literally is like, hey, whatever it is that you're not going to eat at the end of the day and just throw away, can I just have some of that? Can I just have the scraps, the leftovers? Uh, if you've got some clothing that, you know, it has holes in it, it's stained, you can't clean it up. Could I just have those so that I have something on my body? Can I just have the leftovers? And I just want to tell you that, that, that it's really important that we not assume that we know what a person in need actually needs. So many times we see somebody coming and we go, oh man, they're coming to ask for money, right? And the truth is they very well may be coming to ask for money, but we should not be quick to make that assumption when we see somebody who might be in need. We should be ready to listen to what the need is, evaluate our capacity to step in in their need. And so uh, I think that oftentimes we see somebody coming who we think is in need and we begin to go ahead and make all of the excuses as to why we should turn the other way, ignore them, not interact with them. So the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. I wanna pause here, just a little uh, rabbit trail for you. There's this term here, it says by Abraham's side, if you've ever heard this taught out of like the King James, New King James, uh, you're gonna see that it says to Abraham's bosom. And so this is one of those things that gets talked about sometimes in church. You might've heard this uh, and it's only mentioned right here. We don't see this anywhere else in scripture. And uh, a lot of times the, the church will make a big deal out of this idea of like, well, Abraham's bosom, it was this place where uh, everybody uh, went when they died because Jesus had not died on the cross. He was not resurrected. And so there's this, there's this like holding place and Abraham's over it. Um, and, and maybe that's the case. But I think what Jesus is doing here is Jesus is naming uh, for them, he's name dropping, right? The, 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 the person that among them, they would all hold to have been somebody who was great in the faith, somebody who really loved the Lord, somebody who led the people well, Abraham. And so this poor man, Lazarus, now is in the presence of Abraham. You see, any good believer during this time would have hoped that upon dying, they would be in the same place that Abraham is. Just as for us as Christians, we believe that when we die, we'll go to be with Jesus and that while we are there, we will be in the midst of some of the great heroes of the faith and some great heroes who have loved the Lord in our time. And so he's name dropping this guy, Lazarus, the poor guy, he ends up with Abraham, right? Now, the, 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 the rich guy, though, he gets buried and it says that he ends up in Hades. We'll get that in the next verse, but I want to just tell you that heaven and hell are real. Uh, there was an interesting survey, not, this is number of surveys that have been done. Uh, I really like the Arizona Christian uh, University one. You can look that up. They do it every year. But it's fascinating to me how many Christians, quote unquote, just self-identifying, believe in heaven right? It's something like 80% say, yes, I believe in heaven. But that number drops below 50% who believe in hell. Isn't that just like us as, as, as just human beings? All we want's the good and we just pretend that the bad doesn't exist. We hate consequences, right? We don't want anything to do with consequences. Yes, I made a mistake, but I don't want any consequences, right? So if you're a good father in the house and you've been raising your kids, one of the critical lessons that I hope you have instilled in your children's lives and you continue to instill is that consequences are a reality, 
right? There are not many times in life where you will do something wrong and not face consequences. If you are speeding past a police officer, you are very likely to face the consequences of a speeding ticket. That's a very simple one. If you go and rob a place, then you are likely to face the consequences of a criminal hearing once you have been apprehended. Uh, if you cheat on somebody that you are in a relationship with, you are bound to face the consequences of that violation, right? So there are consequences that you will face in life. And as much as you want to pretend like consequences don't exist and I'm exempt and I'm special and I get it a little bit better than everybody else, uh, what Jesus is communicating to us consistently throughout the word is that there is a glorious heaven that God is going to reestablish a new heaven, a new earth, and that the believers are going to dwell in that place. But those that reject him will be separated from for eternity in a place that he refers to as Hades, right here in verse 23. And it says that he's in Hades. And in case you were thinking, well, Hades is not really that bad. It's just kind of like a broken down amusement park, right? They just don't have the best of the best. Well, that's not how Jesus uh, describes it. He says that this guy is in torment and he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. And so what does he say? He says, please, can I just have the scraps? Can Lazarus just give me just a little bit, the little excess of some of that water to cool my tongue? And I think that this is interesting too, is that he knew who Lazarus was. He sees Lazarus and he's like, oh yeah, that's Lazarus. He was sitting at my gate, always just wanting my leftovers, right? And, and, and so this just adds to, to the indifference of this man, to be able to see someone in need and justify not stepping in and helping them. Now, part of stepping in when somebody is in need is not just letting somebody say, hey, I need this, and so I just give it because they demanded it. Part of it is evaluating where they're at. Remember, there are consequences for your actions. And so we understand that. And so we don't help somebody in need just because they're facing a difficult situation because if they're facing a difficult situation as consequences of their behavior, then sometimes they need to face the, that difficult uh, situation, right? Uh, I had a, a gentleman uh, one time who uh, had, had come to the church for a little while and he was in trouble with the law because he had done something that uh, was, is, is very illegal and he was going to court and he called me from the courtroom on break and he said, hey, I just call in to tell you it's not looking good. Can you please pray that, uh, uh, that they will you know, find me not guilty and that I, I won't get in any trouble? And uh, I was like, man, I, I can't pray that prayer for you. And he was like, why won't you pray that prayer? I said, what I'll pray is, is that God's favor will be on you that uh, whatever is best for you, whatever's gonna help you grow to become the man that God would want you to be. Th like, I'll pray that prayer, right? But you did this thing, there are consequences for your action and I'm not gonna pray you out of consequences. I'm gonna pray that God's will be done. And he told me, he said, I've called multiple pastors from family members and every one of them has prayed that I would just get off scot-free. Why won't you do that? And I was like, well, I just don't believe that that's a biblical response, right? The, you, you've made your bed to some degree, like, hey, let's start working on how to get out of that. And so we don't do good when somebody is in need by uh, equipping them to stay in that place. We want to help identify the need and help them move beyond the need. Am I making sense in what I'm saying? So, so like if we go back to the book of Ruth and we see Ruth is in desperate need, they're starving. There is a system in place where she can go, it's called gleaning. And so she's able to go and pick up all the food that has fallen off of the wagon as they've been picking uh, the harvest. And she now has something to eat. So there is a means by by which her needs are met, but there is also a means by which she is participating. And this is the system that we find in scripture. And so the guy here at Lazarus is not asking, hey, listen, I need you to go get me uh, an apartment and pay all my bills and you know, take care of me for forever. He just says, look, can I get scraps? I'm, I'm trying to get out of the position that I'm in. 
And for whatever reason, the rich man uh, it just doesn't seem to have cared. Now he knows who he is and he reaches out. And in case you were just wondering again about this idea of Hades and you're one of those people who's like, yeah, it can't be as bad as you make it out to be. Uh, Jesus uses this word flame and he's, it, it literally translates not to, uh, not to, you know, candied bacon, but to fire and blaze, okay? So... Hades is not a bacon bar. Hades is a place of torment and discomfort, okay? Uh, and uh, I, I don't want you to come to know Jesus because you're afraid of fire. I want you to come to know Jesus because Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be with you for eternity, okay? Uh, coming to know Jesus is about being in relationship with him. It's not fire insurance, but those that reject Jesus, they have to face the consequences. And those consequences are what are laid out there in Hades. He goes on in verse 25, it says, but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner, bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. So uh, is God okay with you having wealth? Absolutely, God is okay with you having wealth, but God is okay with you not having wealth. And so for Lazarus, he received, what does it say? Bad things. Abraham was aware of this. God was okay with it. It is okay in our lives for everything not to be okay. It is okay. God is perfectly fine with us walking through seasons uh, of famine. We look at uh, the story of Joseph, right? There's gonna be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So what do we do? We learn to steward well so that when we are in the season of feasts, we manage to prepare for seasons of famine. And so it is okay that sometimes things get difficult. I think uh, part of the problem we have as Americans is we exempt ourselves from this and we forget that there are people who love Jesus. They call themselves Christians. They are faithfully in their words. They are in their word. They're faithfully praying. They are faithfully gathering with other believers and they live in places where uh, poverty is the only option or persecution is the only option option. It's illegal to be a believer and yet they do it nonetheless. So we aren't better than them, right? I'm not a, I'm not a better person than a Christian right now in Gaza, right? Uh, those that love Jesus and are in Gaza and facing the war that's taking place there, right? And they're having to live their life very differently than me, okay? I also understand that God is perfectly fine with us being in different places and different seasons, okay? What he's calling us to do is to care for one another. And so with wealth, we, we find that there are unique risks. I really hope that you get that out of this series, that just money is not the answer to all of your problems, that as you increase uh, or gain wealth in your life, as your portfolio expands, and, 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 and again, I hope that it does, you, you face new risks risks in, uh, in your faith. And so hopefully what happens is that you are growing in your faith as you are growing in your resources. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. What does this tell us? That even in eternity, there will be people who have sympathy for those that are in a position of suffering. But what, what, what Jesus is saying is, is that there are consequences for their decisions and that there is a barrier put in place so that even though we may be sympathetic to those who are suffering, uh, it is the fruit of their decisions, right? It is the consequences of the way that they chose to live their lives. In verse 27, and he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. Now, here we begin with the real issue. Okay, what indifference can do. He says, okay, all right, you can't do anything for me. I am compassionate still for those who are alive. So he's in Hades, he is suffering, he is aware that he has brothers who themselves have rejected this way of right living. There are consequences facing them. And he says that he wants you, he says, I beg you to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers so that he may warn them 
lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, I know a lot of times when we talk about family, right, we can kind of take on this idea of nobody messes with my family, right? I raised my, my kids this way. I told them, I said, look, I love you. I'm not gonna let people mess with you, right? My daughter, I would tell her from a very young age, I would take her out uh, on dates, right? And so uh, we began this process that she would get all dressed up and I would say, where, where would you like to go? It used to be Dairy Queen, like that was it. It was great. It was in, she was a cheap date. We had a blast. As she got older, she began to acquire a taste for the finer things. And so it typically was an expensive Italian restaurant, which is fine. She is worth it. Uh, and I would take her out and we would be sitting there. And I would say, I, I do this thing with my kids where I kind of, uh, I feel like I'm, I have to make sure that there are some things that are anchored in their hearts. And one of those things was how they are treated and specifically my daughter to be treated by a gentleman. And I would tell her, have you had fun? Yes, I've had fun. Uh, Have I treated you well? Yes, I've treated you well. Well, one day a guy might come around who doesn't want to treat you well, and he might make expectations known or demands of you, and they are very different than what I have asked of you or how we have been today. And listen, here's what you get to do. You get to say, hey, I have more fun on a date with my dad than I have with you. Uh, I'm out. Call me. I'll come pick you up, and we'll go out on a date again. And so I just wanted to drill this down in her that she does not have to be disrespected. So, right, we do this because it's family, right? We love family. We fight for family. Nobody messes with family. But loving family does not make you righteous. Being a dad that defends his children is not going to get you into eternity. Having brothers and sisters who you rise to their defense and you help them in their times of need is not going to get you into eternity. If it is your brother who is the poor man sitting at the gate and you go, that's my brother, I can't let this happen, and you help them out of poverty, that is not going to save you. You see, what you're doing there is you are just coming to the bare minimum expectation. At the bare minimum, you should be loving your family. What Jesus is calling us to is to love the world around us beyond our brothers and sisters, our moms and our dads and our children, our nieces, our nephews. We have to move beyond that to the stranger, to the person who is far from Christ, who may not have a dad to defend them. Men, there is a great need in our world right here in our communities for us to rise up and step into the role of being like a father or a brother to others because there is such a failure among men in our society. The number of homes without a father in them is staggering. How many men are narcissistic, living for themselves, chasing their own sexual appetite and running from home to home, making children but having nothing to do with their kids. We as men need to be able to help identify and help those young people know that they are loved and be ready to speak into their lives and look for opportunities to rise to that occasion. It's not enough just to care about our family. And so we see that he's sympathetic because he's got five brothers and he's worried that they're all gonna end up in the same place. And it says, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, Let let them hear them. So they've got Moses and the prophets. Now you read this and you think, well, you know, Moses is running around and he's saying some things, right? Moses and the prophets though are all dead. So what is it that Abraham is saying? They have Moses and the prophets. What they have is the teachings of Moses and the prophets. Interestingly enough, you and I have those same teachings. It's called the scripture. And what Abraham says is that if they don't accept the scripture, right, then they will accept nothing. He goes here and he says, uh, the, the rich man says, no, 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 Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He says, look, if there is a miracle that takes place, right? If there is a miracle, if somebody is raised from the dead, oh man, they're gonna get it all figured out, right? And I'm gonna tell you, we can fall into this trap, right? Won't he do it? Oh, I believe in miracles. God will do a miracle. What we need is a miracle right now, right? And Abraham is gonna make an argument that the miracle actually doesn't really do anything to build their faith. And here's why. He said to them, 
He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. If they don't believe the scripture, if they don't look at the word of God and say, this is already a supernatural miracle. This is all, God has already spoken. If that's not an anchor, right? If you're not already leaning into the word of God and saying, man, God has spoken. Then when a miracle happens, you're not going to point it to God. You're gonna make all kinds of excuses. The, the retina, right, in your eye. This is a, a kind of a, a, a very interesting part of the body. Um, if your retina detaches, right, if they catch it soon enough, now in the last few years, they have developed some procedures to help reattach that retina. But with a detached retina, you're blind. Right? There's, there's nothing. There's no, there's no light being transmitted into your body, into your brain to be able to make out images. When your retina detaches, it's, uh, you're blind. And again, if they catch it soon enough, there are some procedures that they can do uh, to, to help. The, the odds of a retina reattaching on its own, I, I was looking at this, uh, and, and it's so improbable that they don't have any data points. It's almost non-existent. It's not like it's one in a hundred or one in a million. It is so rare that they have no way to put any data to it. Now, when uh, uh, Zoe was born, this is my third child, uh, he had a, an issue in his body that created a lot of swelling and both of his retinas detached. And so they told us, they said, hey, listen, here's the thing you need to know. Uh, your son is going to be blind for the rest of his life. And this is a very, very true story. They told us this, they said, there is no chance that he will ever see. At this point, there is no surgery that they can do. His retinas are detached. They have clotted over, it's done. Blind for the rest of his life. If he even survives, he'll be blind. And so we accept this, we move on several days. The eye doctor keeps coming, he keeps looking, he keeps saying, gonna be blind, nothing's changing. And one day my wife, my amazing wife shows up in the NIC unit uh, and they ask her, have you spoken with the eye doctor? She says, no. And they said, well, uh, he did an eye exam on your son and screamed really loud and ran out of here like a madman. And we're not really sure what's going on. We were hoping you could tell us. So, you know, she's calling me, we're calling the eye doctor, what's going on? The nurses are confused, the doctors are worried, is something going on? And when we finally hear from him, he says, I had to leave and go do research. Um, he said, I don't know what to tell you, but both of the retinas are reattached. Your son's sight is restored. It doesn't make any sense. He said, I can't find an example in any of my medical books of a retina being attached, much less both of them reattaching between yesterday and today. And he says, all I can tell you is it's a miracle. Now I can tell you today that miracle, but if you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't hold to the word of God, what you're gonna do with that miracle, whether it's somebody being raised from the dead or a pair of retinas reattaching is you're just gonna assign it to something else. You see, as long as you are hostile to God, it doesn't matter how many miracles take place in your life. It doesn't matter how many times cancer is beaten down and, and uh, uh, families are restored and wealth is redistributed and you find yourself knocking on death's door and you get back up. If you don't hold that the word of God is God's word, then you will make every excuse under the sun as to why that happened. What Abraham is saying here is he goes, it doesn't matter if a dead man comes. They don't believe Moses and the prophets. They don't hold to the scripture. They already reject it. So all that they're gonna say is, this was some really cool magic. Somebody's got some special magic stone out there. They're gonna come up with a reason as to why it is that the dead has raised. But as followers of Christ, people who hold to the scriptures, when a miracle takes place, we are able to go, look what God did. Look how God moved. You, you, the reason it's inexplainable, the reason that nobody can get their head around it is because God is faithful to do what nobody else can understand. And the unfortunate reality is that for too many people, as they gain resources, as their wealth increases, they become more and more indifferent to the world around them more and more indifferent to the word of God, 
It's not uncommon for people as they gain resources in their life to become more and more disconnected from church community, from relationships, from the faith, right? All of the excuses. I've got the money now to be out on the boat on the weekend. I still got to work Monday through Friday. So yeah, I don't do church because the, the Sunday is when I go fishing, right? I've got long weekends. I've got the money. I'm jet setting around the world. I've got the money. I'm going to do this. And you're losing the community that God has called you to. And slowly the teachings from scripture begin to erode in your life. And you begin to go, well, I mean, I don't really need God. I've got the money to handle all of my problems. The only exception to that is when something arises that goes, that goes beyond those resources. I was watching a, a video yesterday from a guy um, who has just uh, found a lot of success, um, former Navy SEAL. He's found a lot of success on the other end uh, of, of that. And he's been doing really well and has just really been rejecting God in his story. And something has happened in his life that's pretty devastating. And he ended up in jail. And he was saying that like that was a wake up call for his faith right? Is that all of this money, all of the hype, all of the cloud, all of the relationships, none of that was fixing him. None of that was helping him. None of that was going to save him in the end. And that he realizes that he needs to be a man of prayer. He needs to be able to turn to God. And so sometimes that happens. The goal should be that it doesn't need to happen in your life. Don't become indifferent. Don't become indifferent to the things of God. Scripture calls us to be in church among other believers. Do you have to go to church to go to heaven? I'm not making that argument, but I am telling you that the scripture calls us to be in a body of believers. Do I have to give to the local church and to ministry opportunities to go to heaven? No, I'm not gonna make that argument for you, but the scripture does call us to manage our resources in a way that we invest in the local church. Don't become indifferent. Don't become the exception. Make sure that you continue to maintain that relationship with God. Let's stand to our feet as we close here. It's always an honor for me to be able to, to, to share, to be able to teach. Uh, I love doing what we do here at City Church. I love the fact that we have so many people who call City Church home who have been here for so long and continue to be invested in the ministry. And uh, I, I love that because I feel like that, that we do a great job at breaking that mindset of indifference, right? And I've watched as so many of your lives have changed as you have come to know the Lord, your families have come to know the Lord, you've become anchored in your faith and you have continued to find increase in your own lives, yet you continue to show up and be a part of what's happening here. And I love that about our church. There are so many people around us though that would say that they are Christians and yet that in their success, and some of that is just a modicum of success that comes from being in America, they become indifferent. And I just wanna encourage you, don't just, don't just fight indifference, but lead others away from indifference. Uh, be a light in the darkness. Be, be, a, be a person, a contact for community around you. I wanna pray this prayer of blessing over you as we close today out of Numbers chapter six. If you would right now, just bow your heads for a moment and receive this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you care for us, that you are for us and not against us. I pray that as we leave this place today, as you are uh, equipping many of us to step into new ventures, new opportunities in our lives, as you are increasing our wealth, as you are increasing our opportunity for resources, Father, I pray that, that we would be wise to the risks that come with it, that we would receive your teaching that we would receive your instruction and that we would be good managers of that which you have entrusted to us. Uh, help us to continue to grow, to continue to do better uh, than we have done before uh, in such a way that it honors you. Thank you for all that you're doing. We love you and praise you. And we ask this in your mighty name. Amen, amen. Hey, our prayer ministry team is gonna make their way to the front. Uh, if you're in need of prayer here today, uh, the scripture says, come to the leaders of the church for
for prayer. We want to be in prayer with you. Uh, if you ever find yourself in a place where you are managing wealth and you, and you have questions, just like you would ask questions about your faith, don't be afraid to reach out. If I don't have the answers, I will connect you with people who I believe do have the answers. We love you guys. Have a great Father's Day. We'll see you Wednesday for prayer and next Sunday for service. Until then, go change your world.